All right, welcome back to Unit 2. So we're going to continue on with our chemistry chapter. So we left off on hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions are very reactive in solution. So we're going more into a pH kind of talk right now. Because they're so reactive, the body has to precisely regulate or regulate them or extreme disruptions to tissues can occur. Acidosis can occur and cause a lot of health complications. Hydrogen ion makes solutions more acidic. When there are more hydrogen ions in a solution, the pH will lower. pH actually stands for power of hydrogen, so when we're measuring pH, we're actually measuring the amount of hydrogen in solution. The math is pretty complicated. There's a lot of logarithms, so even though that it's measuring the power of hydrogen, the higher the number of the pH, the more basic it is, rather than acidic. Hydroxide ions are usually abbreviated OH. They're formed from the dissociation of water molecules. So when water molecules break into hydroxide ions and hydrogen ions, hydroxide ions make solutions more basic, so the pH raises. Water molecules don't dissociate in pure water very, very often, so the number is generally pretty low. So pH ranges from 0 to 14. The pH of water is 7. That's considered neutral. From there, anything below 7 is acidic, and every, anything above 7 is alkaline or basic. Our blood pH has to stay between 7.35 and 7.45. Any changes below or above that can result in acidosis or alkalosis. Even 7.34 would cause some significant health issues. It's extremely important for our bodies to maintain this blood pH. <clears throat> Acidosis is a lower blood pH, anything lower than 7.35. When it starts to get under 7, that can change into a coma. That can cause a coma. Alkalosis is a high blood pH. It's anything above 7.45. If it starts to get above 7.8, that can result in sustained muscle contractions or tetany. And they're uncontrollable. So acids are any solute that dissociates in a solution and releases hydro hydrogen ions. As we've previously mentioned, that will lower the pH and acids are generally considered to be proton donors. Usually hydrogen ions are considered to be protons, so when they release hydrogen ions, they're considered to be proton donors. Strong acids are going to dissociate completely in solution. An example would be HCl or hydrochloric acid. This is the acid that's in our stomachs. Hydrochloric acid dissociates completely into hydrogen ions and chloride ions. Strong bases also dissociate completely in solution. An example would be sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide would dissociate into sodium and a hydroxide ion. Some examples of a strong base are over-the-counter cleaners like Drano. Weak acid and bases do not dissociate completely in solution. They tend to have less of an impact on pH. One good example is carbonic acid and bicarbonate. So that's a reversible reaction where carbonic acid can dissociate into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. And depending on how much of each you need, they kind of act as a buffer system in your body. It tends to be a reversible reaction. A salt is any ionic compound that contains a cation or anion with the exceptions of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. Otherwise, they would be acids or bases. Salts will also dissociate completely in water. 
or ionize. They can slightly alter the pH or be neutral, but they won't make any drastic changes in pH. Buffers tend to stabilize the pH by removing or replacing hydrogen ions. They tend to consist of weak acids and salts, which tend to be weak bases. So like we said before, weak acids and bases do not dissociate completely, and they tend to not have as strong of an effect on the pH as strong acids and bases. So one example of something that you might use on a regular basis or every so often are anacids. They act as buffers. So anacids have bicarbonate, and the bicarbonate neutralizes our stomach acid, the hydrochloric acid. And that results in a product of water and salt. So when we're producing too much stomach acid, that's when antacids are needed, like Tums. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears into our macromolecules. Macromolecules are known as polymers, which means that they're made up of smaller things. So polymers are made up of monomers. Monomers are building blocks. So each of our macromolecules is going to have its own specific monomer or building block that it's made out of. Carbohydrates are made of monosaccharides. Nucleic acids are made of nucleotides. Proteins are made of amino acids. And lipids are made out of fatty acids and glycerol. It's also important to keep in mind that each of these have their own specifically named bonds. So we'll go through those as they come. So carbohydrates. All of our macromolecules are known as organic molecules. They're going to contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen at a ratio of 1 to 2 to 1. One carbon every two hydrogen, hydrogens to every one oxygen. They account for less than 1% of our body weight, but they are 45 to 65% of our diets. They are the most important energy source that we take in in our diets. So monosaccharides, we said, are the monomers of carbohydrates. So mono means one, saccharide means sugar. So simple sugars. Monosaccharides are named, off, named based off of the number of carbons that they have. So trios would be three carbons, tetros four, pentose five, hexos six. Most of our important monosaccharides are hexose sugars, like glucose, galactose, and fructose. Most importantly for us, glucose is the most important metabolic fuel. We use it for all of our pathways to make energy. Monosaccharides also dissolve readily in water. And some of these hexoses might be isomers, so they could have different properties, not to be confused with isotopes. So isomers are going to have the same chemical makeup, but they're going to have different structures. So glucose and fructose have the same number of carbons and hydrogens, but they're branched a little bit differently. Disaccharides are two monosaccharides that are joined together. This involves a dehydration, dehydration synthesis reaction where you take water out of a compound in order to join them together. They are joined by a bond called glycosidic bonds. Disaccharides tend to be found in unhealthy foods, used as artificial sweeteners. Some examples of disaccharides are lactose, which is a combination of glucose and, lac and galactose sucrose, which is glucose and fructose, and mannose, which is two glucose molecules bonded together. Polysaccharides can be straight or branched. That will determine their chemical properties as well. Cellulose is found in cell walls of plants. It makes their walls rigid for protection against the elements. Humans cannot break down cellulose, uh, but Different herbivores can because they have an enzyme called cellulase. Cellulose is really found in high quantities in our stockier 
vegetables. One really good example is celery. So we can't digest the cellulose in celery, but we can use it for fiber. Or plants store their starch as amylose or amylopectin. And humans have enzymes that can break down that starch into glucose so that it's a usable form. So starch is a major dietary energy source for us. It does not readily dissolve. That's why we need these enzymes called amylases. And then glycogen is our normal storage form of glucose. It's stored in our muscles and our liver. It does not readily dissolve. And it, they tend to exist in branched chains. So the reason why we have this storage form of glucose is when we're in a fasting state or we haven't eaten in a long period of time and our blood sugar starts to drop, glycogen is then released and broken down into usable glucose for energy. Okay, so let's talk about lipids. Lipids have a carbon to hydrogen ratio of 1 to 2. Some different examples of lipids are fats, oils, and waxes. They are hydrophobic, meaning water-fearing, so they do not mix with water. I'm sure if you've ever tried to mix water and vinegar, water and oil, they do not mix. Lipids form some of our really important structural components, especially the plasma membrane of our cells. They exist as important energy reserves. In men, it accounts for 12 to 18 percent of their body weight, and women, 18 to 24 percent. Okay, so fatty acids are one of the monomers of lipids. Fatty acids and glycerol together form the monomers. So they are hydrophobic, so they do have that limited solubility in water. Fatty acids can be saturated, unsaturated, or trans fats. Saturated fatty acids means that all of the carbons in the chain are held together by single bonds and are completely saturated with hydrogens. So they are all bonded to, all of their available bonds are taken up by hydrogens. Unsaturated fatty acids means that there is at least one double bond existing so that the carbons are not completely saturated with as many hydrogens as they possibly could be. So a monounsaturated fatty acid means that there's one double bond, polyunsaturated is more than one. Polyunsaturated are the healthier the healthiest of these fats, and monounsaturated is second, saturated is third, trans fats comes dead last. So trans fats have a different type of structure than a saturated fatty acid. They form these linear chains. The double bonds in the unsaturated fatty acids create a kink in the molecule so that they cannot stack on top of each other in these long parallel rows. And that's important when it comes to storing fats, especially in things like arteries. If you eat a lot of trans fats in your diets, you're more likely to have um, issues with atherosclerosis and placking in these arteries with these fat molecules. Because there's a kink in the chain for the unsaturated fatty acids, it is more difficult for them to stack up and occlude things. Icosanoids are a type of lipid that are derived from arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is one of our essential fatty acids. That means that it must come from your diet. You cannot synthesize it yourself. It's considered an omega-6 fatty acid. <clears throat> Some really good sources for a or for arachidonic acid is chicken, eggs, lamb, beef. Um, if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, vegetable or seed-based oils are really good sources as well. Some different types of icosanoids. Leukotrienes are involved with injury and disease response. They kind of act as little markers for inflammation. Prostaglandins are released by damaged tissues. They help to stimulate uterine contractions. 
So although there's the word prostate in the name, both men and women have prostaglandins. Originally, they only did their research on men, so they didn't know that these things also existed in women. Not the prostate gland, but the prostaglandins. Prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are considered to be local hormones. So while hormones have, general hormones have target tissues and they create this widespread effect, local hormones only affect the tissue that they are, um, the, the surrounding tissues from where they are secreted or the tissue itself that is secreting said local hormone. So both leukotrienes and prostaglandins have big implications with inflammation and wound healing. Okay, so when fatty acids are attached to glycerol molecules, they make glycerides. So a monoglyceride is one fatty acid and a glycerol molecule, a diglyceride is two fatty acids and a glycerol, and a triglyceride or a triacylglyceride is a glycerol and three fatty acids. And generally, when you get a cholesterol panel done, you get your trigs or triglycerides run as well. So triglycerides or triacylglycerides or triacylglycerols, also known as neutral fats, they've got lots of names, all same thing. They tend to be stored as liquid droplets in cells. They retain lipid-soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, E, and K. Also pesticides, which is why pesticide poisoning can be such a big thing. Some of the functions of triglycerides, they are a great energy source. So a significant portion of our stored energy is stored as fat in these triglycerides. They act as a source of insulation. So they slow the heat loss to the environment. And they act as protection because a lot of our fat stores surround our organs for shock absorption and to prevent injuries from really injuring our organs, especially our kidneys. They're stored in a pretty large fat pouch in our flanks. Steroids are larger, lipi larger lipid molecules. They function to maintain the plasma membranes of cells as cholesterol. Cholesterol makes our plasma membranes rigid but also flexible. They regulate sexual function because as acti by acting as steroid hormones like testosterone and estrogen. They regulate tissue metabolism and mineral balance by hormones corticosteroids and calcitriol. And they also pro process dietary fats as bile salts. So bile salts are produced by the liver, stored in the gallbladder, and help to break down fats from our diet. There are two different ways to make cholesterol. You can absorb it from animal products in your diet, or you can make it yourself, synthesize it in your body. Some dietary sources of cholesterol are liver, meat, shellfish, and egg yolks. Cholesterol is not as bad as the rabbit gets. There are really healthy sources of cholesterol, HDL, high-density lipoproteins. When you have high levels of HDLs in your body, it actually acts as a protective barrier to limit your chances of getting heart disease. So that's really important. When your triglycerides and your LDLs or your VLDLs are high, those are your bad cholesterol. So hypercholesterolemia is having high levels of cholesterol in your blood circulating. And CAT stands for coronary artery disease. This is when you have a lot of lipid placking in your arteries. Generally, when this happens, they test to see how occluded the artery is and generally place a stent so that no heart attacks occur, if possible. 
So phospholipids and glycolipids, they're both synthesized from fatty acids. They're both considered to be structural lipids. They form and maintain membranes. Phospholipids form our bilayer that forms our plasma membranes. The plasma membranes have the hydrophobic insides and hydrophilic outsides. It allows water, it keeps water out and it keeps liquids in the cell that need to be kept in the cell. Otherwise, if there was just a completely permeable membrane, water would flood our cells and destroy them. If phospholipids are within water, they form micelles. I'm sure you've heard of micelles if you have used a micellar face wash. Micelles are also in soaps. They help to, they're kind of like these phospholipid membranes, but instead of being a flat surface, they're spheres and they encompass these nonpolar molecules to help break them down. Okay, so proteins. Proteins are not only the most abundant organic molecules that we have, but they're the most diverse. They count for about 20% of our body weight, and they have many functions. They act as support systems because we have structural proteins that create the framework for our body's cells and tissues. They help with movement as our contractile proteins are responsible for muscle contractions. They help with transport. We have these blood proteins that help carry oxygen throughout our blood, hemoglobin and myoglobin. They act as buffers to protect against dangerous pH changes. They help with metabolic regulation as enzymes. They help with coordination and control as hormones. And with defense, by helping to waterproof our skin, by acting as antibodies, and also clotting proteins. So, like we said before, the monomers of proteins are amino acids. There are about 20 significant amino acids in our body, nine of which are essential, therefore we cannot make them our, by ourselves, and they must be obtained by the diet. Some amino acids are known as Witter ions, which are molecules that have both a positive and a negative charge, but, net, but a net charge of zero. The special bond that holds amino acids together to form polypeptides and then proteins are called peptide bonds. So peptides are chains of amino acids, many chains of peptides are polypeptides, and once they gain a unique function, with a unique name, they become proteins. The primary structure of proteins is just their linear chain of amino acids and their unique amino acid sequence. The secondary structure results from hydrogen bonding between these amino acids, and they form alpha, an alpha helix or alpha helices if it's plural, and beta pleated sheets. The tertiary structure is the 3D structure that is comprised of coiling and folding between these alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. They also form disulfide linkages, which are permanent. And then the quaternary structure is the interaction between individual polypeptide chains to form a larger complex. Some examples are hemoglobin, collagen, and keratin, which are, are larger proteins. So some proteins don't have all four structures, some of them only have a few, some have all four. Um, regardless, depending on which structures they have, that will determine their shape, specifically their primary structure. Proteins can also be globular or fibrous. If they're globular, then they are soluble in water. Some of examples of globular proteins are, are our enzymes, hormones, bloodstream proteins, and their shape comes from their tertiary structure. The fibrous proteins tend to be more extended sheets or strands. They're tough, durable, and tend to be insoluble in water, and examples keratin. 
They tend to play a structural role in our bodies, and their shapes are due to their secondary or quaternary structure. So generally, this sequence of amino acids determines the shape, that primary structure. Without that sequence, the protein cannot perform its function. So this is a point in which mutations can occur. If it's off by even one amino acid, the entire function can be disrupted and disease processes can occur, such as sickle cell anemia and some cancers. Sickle cell anemia is when there is a mutation within the primary structure of the protein chain. And the red blood cell becomes more of a sickle shape than that regular biconcave disc. And then a lot of clumping can occur, causing a lot of health crises and health complications. So we said that a type of protein are these enzymes. They're the most important of all of our body's proteins. They regulate our metabolism and make sure all of our bodily processes are functioning properly. The reactants in these reactions are known as substrates. Substrates will bind to the enzyme at an active site. The active site is very specific just for the substrate, as an enzyme is only going to catalyze or speed up one specific reaction. So you can see in this picture that it's kind of like a lock and key format. They used to call it that, not so much anymore, because it implies that there's not this intermediary step where there's this enzyme substrate complex. It's also pretty cool to imagine that there are all of these enzymes in your body and for all of their, their diverse functions that they perform, they all have different shapes because they have to be specific for specific substrates. So, like I said, enzymes have specificity. Each enzyme is only going to catalyze one reaction. They have saturation limits, which is the substrate concentration required to reach the maximal rate of reaction. Beyond the amount of which, in which the enzyme is saturated, the reaction cannot run any quicker than that. You don't have enough enzymes to satisfy that need. Enzymes can also function in regulation. There are certain environmental conditions that can turn enzymes on or off, as enzymes typically function in, a, in ideal conditions. So they have a specific pH or temperature that they like to run at, and if anything goes above or beyond that, the enzymes can turn on or off or denature. Cofactors bind to enzymes before substrates can bind. They're kind of like little helpers. They tend to be our microminerals that we ingest through our diets. Without cofactors, enzymes tend to be intact but not functional. Coenzymes function as cofactors, but they are vitamins. So equally important. So like I said, each enzyme is going to have its own ideal pH and temperature. If anything goes beyond that, it can result in denaturation or the enzyme being losing its function. Denaturation can be, may or may not be permanent. It really depends upon how far beyond its ideal limits it has gone. Uh, one really good example of permanent denaturation is if you think of cooking an egg, that the egg whites have this protein called albumin in them, which is also a protein that we have in our kidneys. As you cook the egg, you notice that the egg whites turn from a clear color to a white color. And if you were to leave that egg in that pan, the egg white would not resort back to the clear color. So that enzyme is completely denatured. One example of an enzyme having really specific conditions is pepsin. Pepsin is an enzyme that works in our stomachs, and as we know, hydrochloric acid lives there and is extremely acidic. 
It tends to be between 1 and 2 on the pH scale. So pepsin likes to be between 1 and 2 on the pH scale. All of the enzymes that are functioning within our bodies to regulate our bodily processes tend to work at more of a body temperature. Glycoproteins and proteoglycans are combinations of proteins and carbs. They play a role in forming mucus, determining self and non-self, which is extremely important. I mean, think about how your white blood cells and your inflammatory markers need to be able to determine if you have a foreign invader in the, in the form of a bacterium or virus in your body or a cancer cell and knowing how to attack that without attacking your healthy tissue. They also play a part in structure, enzymes, antibodies, and hormones. So they are very diverse. So let's switch gears into nucleic acids. They store and transfer information. We have two primary nucleic acids, deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, and ribonucleic acid, or RNA. DNA has instructions for making proteins, and then RNA makes them. So we said that the monomers of nucleic acids are nucleotides. Those are made up of a pentose sugar, phosphate group, and nitrogenous bases. The pentose can be either a ribose or deoxyribose, ribose in the case of RNA, deoxyribose in the case of DNA. There are five different nitrogenous bases that exist. Thymine, guanine, cytosine, adenine, and uracil. In DNA, DNA has four of these. It has the first four, thymine, guanine, cytosine, and adenine. RNA has four of these as well. The last four, guanine, cytosine, adenine, and uracil. The sequence of these nitrogenous bases in DNA tells RNA how to make these proteins. The DNA molecules have complementary strands, so they're double-stranded while RNA is single-stranded. In these complementary strands, they have nitrogenous bases on either side that like to pair with their complementary base pair. So in DNA, adenine and thymine like to pair together, cytosine and guanine like to pair together. That will never change in DNA. A and T and G and C. A and T go together, G and C go together. In RNA, base pairing also occurs between adenine and uracil, A and U, and guanine and cytosine, G and C. Protein synthesis will require rRNA, mRNA, and tRNA. rRNA stands for ribosomal RNA, and that's the place where mRNA will bind in the ribosome, is messenger RNA. And it's going to transcribe the complementary DNA strand into an RNA strand. And then tRNA is transfer RNA. It's going to translate the RNA sequence into a protein, into amino acids. So here's just a little recap on RNA versus DNA. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Cells have to use energy in order to perform vital functions. You need energy in order to do any of your activities of daily living. In order to create energy, we need to create and break down high energy bonds. The creation of high energy bonds occurs via phosphorylation or adding a phosphate group to another molecule. Our general source of energy is ATP. So phosphorylation occurs with adenosine monophosphate to make adenosine diphosphate to make adenosine triphosphate. So one phosphate group to two to three. The breakdown of ATP into ADP via the enzyme ATPase is that breakdown of that high energy bond 
which is going to release energy that we can actually use. And lastly, let's talk about that case study that we went over. So we started off last week with this case study about baby Sean and his issues with um, his digestive issues and his breathing issues. So baby Sean has CF or cystic fibrosis. With CF, he creates a lot of digestive juices. They're thick and they clog the pancreas. So the digestive system doesn't get the enzymes needed to break down any of his foods that he's taking into his body. So without that, he can't digest any of the food he eats. So we can't use any of those nutrients to make energy or for any of his normal processes. It also adversely affects sodium chloride transport, which can result in a lot of complications as well. He's losing a lot of NACL in sweat, which is why his skin tastes so salty. The classic signs of cystic fibrosis are these respiratory symptoms, but a lot of people don't really take into consideration the effects that it can have on the digestive system. So let me know if you have any questions on that, and you can start on chapter 3.